Band saw um, is an old tool. It dates from early in the um, Industrial Revolution. In a table saw, uh, when you rip, uh, there are a couple of things that can happen uh, when you start to rip any board. Uh, uh, but uh, if the kerf starts to compress because of tension inside of this board, on a table, a table saw, that blade at the back is grabbing a hold of that piece of wood and it's going to be thrown up and back at you. And, and that's what we call a kickback. Of course, a splitter ameliorates that problem significantly, and you really should never rip without a splitter in a table saw. Uh, it's just plain dangerous. Uh, but when you rip in a bandsaw, all the force is directly down on the table. So uh, it becomes a very safe proposition. Uh, you can do a great deal of ripping uh, in even a modest bandsaw of this size. Uh, you could rip a plank up to uh, uh, six or eight feet long with this. Uh, the with other thing uh, about using a bandsaw to rip is that the kerf is minuscule compared to the average table saw uh, blade. So if you're making tomato snakes, you're going to get an extra tomato steak or two out of every, uh, every board that you rip well, up. While we consider them to be rather safe, they actually don't have the best safety record in the world. And, and the accidents are almost always from somebody pushing their hand or thumb. A lot of cuts here in this area. Uh, from accidentally pushing him. I did it once. Uh, 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 it wasn't very bad. I just barely touched it. But uh, uh, it was uh, three weeks of hell while I kept butterfly bandages on it. So uh, it's to be avoided. Uh, I think why it happens are a couple of things. It is one is that people, you just kind of lose track and you get busy and you don't think. Another thing, if you're cutting any kind of a, a, a scroll type work like bowl blanks and so on, it's very easy to forget where your thumb is and come around into the blade because it cuts out of the piece if you have an uneven edge like a, a piece of green wood that you're cutting. So very much want to think in that direction. I avoid around any machinery using long muscles for the most part. Um, if, if I was cutting down the middle of this and I know my thumb's on each corner, then I would probably push it pretty, pretty normally because even if something happens, I'm going to go by both sides of it. But if I have any doubt or it's a small piece, what I start doing is things like putting my hand under the table and pushing like this. Uh, I do a lot of this with my body. So that I, I push rocking my body forward. And I just, I'm not in a position where that if things go awry that I'm going to go flying off. I'm, I'm using sort of compressive type pushing. The other danger of a bandsaw is that you have what are called the guides. And the guides uh, uh, consist of a ball bearing in back of the blade that touches right back in here. And as you put pressure on the blade, that keeps it from riding further back into the saw. And of course, there's guides at either side that can be ball bearings in this case, or they can be little uh, blocks of steel or blocks of carbon or even blocks of wood. And uh, <clears throat> if you're scroll cutting and you want to back up, there is the danger. If you back up and that blade is sort of caught in the curve, you will pull that right off the tire, really. It'll come forward and there'll be a huge crashing noise. The blade will go into this guard. Uh, often will mark the door in here or down in here. And uh, it, you usually can write the blade off. It's, it's, it's usually toast at that point. So you really want to back up with great care. I usually try to think out my cuts so that I don't have to back up. The classic way these happens is you're cutting a big circle like this. And, and, and somehow you get around and suddenly it's going to hit here. And you sort of, oops, what do I do now? And you don't want to cut through the middle of your circle. So you end up uh, uh, trying to back up and it just doesn't go well. The other uh, trick if you're caught in a piece to back up um, and it's a fairly long curve is drive a wedge in behind it and it'll open it up a lot of times that you can back up a lot better. Talk about capacities for a minute. Uh, a throat is a, a, a common uh, capacity in bandsaws that's touted a lot, and it's the distance from the blade to the 
edge of the column here. And I almost think personally that more important is the height of the cut. And the sort of the more height of the cut within reason you can have in your bandsaw, the better. Uh, and as you start to get in higher grade bandsaws, they usually give you a little more height of cut. With these little, uh, this, this design was originally uh, executed by Delta Milwaukee uh, back in the 1920s. And um, it's really two castings that are bolted together in the middle here. And it allows you to stick what's called a riser block that's a six inch riser block in here so that you can increase this capacity to one foot. I have such a saw in my turning shop and it's fine for turning bowl blanks which don't require any tremendous precision. Uh, but when you start wanting to do fine scroll work with that saw and run small blades, its performance is, is greatly diminished because of the fact that as you start to put that block in there, you don't have nearly the rigidity in that frame and the alignment in that frame that you did uh, before. Uh, when you first buy a saw, uh, the, all the books will tell you how uh, you take the table off and you put a straight edge on the bottom wheel and you see if the top wheel will line up with it. Uh, I have actually seen a good many saws that the wheels were off an eighth inch or so. We found one in Bob's shop yesterday that was uh, uh, back, uh, top wheel was eighth inch of the back of the front wheel. We shimmed it out by making a washer in a wood turning lathe. And to be honest, I don't see that it runs any better before or after the uh, exercise. And I think that this wheel alignment problem, uh, at least in the 14 inch band saws, is probably exaggerated a bit. Uh, as you get into bigger saws, it probably would be more of a problem. And uh, uh, certainly as you get into bigger saws you're usually paying more money and more quality is put into those and so I think it becomes less of a problem to start with. By putting cool blocks in here um, or even wood blocks uh, it's much better than metal guides because the problem is that all of these more inexpensive guides tend to drift a little and uh, and yes you tighten things down with pliers and so on uh, and even then sometimes uh, this back bearing will drift back. This whole blade starts going back into the guides and as it touches a steel guide, uh, it knocks all the set out of the blade and the blade at that point is essentially toast. Uh, so the nice part about wood guides or cool blocks is that it, this material can be cut with the blade without being harming the blade in any way. So you don't lose the blade if the guides go a little out of adjustment. Uh, a lot of these machines now are built out of weldments and again like we talked in in lathes today that a weldment isn't necessarily bad. A well constructed welded saw can be very nice indeed. In fact, here's one, uh, the Powermatic. Uh, it's a nice solid saw and it's uh, uh, the, again this is built in Taiwan or China and uh, uh, but it's it's very nicely done and uh, as you inspect this and look inside it, you'll find that uh, uh, in some ways it may have more rigidity than a lot of the cheaper cast iron ones. There was a general feeling amongst the public that three-wheel band saws are bad. And uh, I think that's more an outgrowth of the fact that most three-wheel band saws were very cheap affairs sold at home centers and, and uh, you know, were real home workshop tools back Oh, up to 10 years ago. Uh, you can take, on the other hand, the Inca bandsaw, which is a big three-wheel bandsaw. One of the finest bandsaws you can buy. It's a very accurate saw, a very finely made saw, and it's a three-wheel design. The nice part about bearings is if they freeze up on you, you can go down to the bearings ink and buy another one for a buck and a half. So uh, it, it's uh, uh, not uncommon. I, uh, uh, after 10 years of use, Mother saw in my shop this, this last summer, we had to completely rebuild the guides and top and bottom guide had seized within about a week of each other and uh, we had to, to put new bearings in it, but no big thing. We went down to Technology Inc. and grabbed a new set of bearings. The tension uh, thing, Attention to another thing, and the latest gimmick is to, to put devices on the saw that release the tension when you're not using it. I know that band saws have been running since the Industrial Revolution uh, with full tension on them, and I just don't see it that this releasing the tension. I think it's 
a gimmick that somebody has come up with and they're going to sell you this gizmo and uh, I can't see that it's necessary there's enough strength in the frame that I don't see with the frames not going to bend from the tension uh, it's not going to hurt the blade I just if the spring wears out you put a new spring in after 20 years in a so. week-long turning course for like bowl turning we're cutting green wood blanks that are like this thick you know one after another all day long and the volume of dust going through that saw is unbelievable uh, and it took 12 years to blow a tire and here we have a, a circle cutting attachment that we made yesterday at Bob's shop that makes good circles and uh, to make a circle we simply put a piece of wood down like this and we'll uh, just tap that, but we're not going to pound on the bandsaw table. And as you can see, I uh, I nailed a, a cleat which I hand planed to fit the slot reasonably well. And now this is a bit of a small, uh, a wide blade for this, but it may work. I'm going to come right up. Pardon? <laughs> yes. I buy for my turning shop, I buy a three tooth skip. And it, you could take a half power saw and cut like crazy with it. Unbelievable how it cuts. It's such an aggressive blade. So a lot of it uh, will be how you, uh, the type of blade you use. The other thing that it's possible to sharpen a we saw. did uh, a blade at Bob's shop yesterday. And I just take a Dremel with about a, 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 an abrasive wheel in it about that round, and I, I, I dress it flat on the front with a dresser. And then I just sit here, and I just peck away at that, and I, I face dress th the edge of the gullet here. And I dress it as square as I can to the, to the machine, and I just keep going up like that. And when you see ground teeth come through... It takes 20 minutes, maybe. On a 1 16th blade, I only use the back guide. I just back the others right out of the way. Olsen's are very good blades. I've bought those by the 100-foot coil toy. Uh, they're extremely, extremely well-made blades. The other thing you can buy for a bandsaw, you can buy abrasive strips that you can put in here and use them as a sander. And it's a neat trick for some kinds of projects where you've got to sand weird stuff and get in. Uh, it, 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 it can be a very nice way to edge sand. And you got a long enough belt that doesn't burn real easy. We think that you can get them from the sanding catalog, which yeah, is uh, Clean Spore. Uh, one thing I think a lot of people resaw with way too fine a blade. They buy one that's 10, 15 teeth per inch, and you just don't have a big enough gullet to pull waste at that point. And when you're trying to resaw something 12 inch high, you want something that's in the three to five tooth per inch. Um, with a good deal of set in it to resaw something like that. They're really going to move, move some material. appreciate everybody bearing with me through uh, all of our turning exercises. <laughs>